The purpose of this video is to introduce the ideas of angular position, angular speed, and angular acceleration for a rotating rigid body. So over here I've got some kind of disc and it's spinning, maybe this way. And the idea is that I can paint a little spot on this disc anywhere I want without any loss of generality. So I'm going to just paint a little white spot of paint here. And then I'm going to watch that spot of paint travel. And that's what we keep track of. And so I could say that I have an initial angle here of theta 1 for the paint spot. And then after some small time delta t, the paint spot ends up over here at an angle of theta 2. And so we could call this change in angle a delta theta. And we could call the radius of this disk r. So now I can define average angular velocity. And that's going to be the total change in angle divided by how long it took. And remember, we were allowing a time delta t to go by. So we use the Greek letter omega for this. And putting a bar over it, that's the average. And it's going to be the change in angle divided by how long it took. You should notice here that the units of omega are going to be units of angle, that's radians, divided by units of time, that's seconds. Now, radians are technically unitless, so you'll often see this written as a 1 over second or even a second to the negative first power. Now we can define instantaneous angular velocity as just being a small time limit of this. In other words, a time derivative. The next step I want to take is to allow my rigid body to spin faster. So perhaps I look at some moment in time, and my paint spot is here. And at that moment in time, I have an instantaneous angular speed of omega 1. And then I watch for a moment as my disk speeds up and at some later time my paint spot is here and the instantaneous angular speed is now omega 2. Well this allows me to define average angular acceleration and that's given by the Greek letter alpha. So we write alpha bar is going to be a change in angular velocity divided by how long it took and again we're just using a delta t for that time. Let's look at the units of alpha. It should have units of omega, which is radians per second, divided by units of time. So it's going to be radians per second per second, or radians per second squared. Again, radians are technically unitless. It doesn't cause any harm to write them down, but you should remember that you can disappear them whenever you like. So the units of angular acceleration are 1 over second squared. Now we could take the small time limit and define instantaneous angular acceleration. And that's going to be alpha equals d omega dt, the time derivative of angular velocity. Or we could write it as a second derivative of the angular position. Now let's look at a quick comparison between the linear kinematic variables and the rotational kinematic variables. So here's a quick reminder of the linear kinematic variables. We have position, and then velocity is the time derivative of position, and then the acceleration is the time derivative of the velocity, or the second derivative of the position. Now let's look at our rotational kinematic variables. And here we are. And I can see that all of these time derivative relationships are precisely the same. And what this implies is that if our angular acceleration is constant, I should get all the same formulas that I got when I assumed my linear acceleration was constant. And this allows us to do a variety of rotational kinematics problems, provided again that the angular acceleration is a constant number. So here's our old set of linear kinematics formulas. And the first two, I would call the fundamental ones, those actually came from applying calculus to those derivative relationships based on the assumption that a is a constant number. The second two come from algebraic manipulations of the first two. And the purpose of this third one here was to eliminate time. So if there's a problem where you don't know how much time a process takes, this can be a, a good shortcut. 
and then the purpose of the last one was to eliminate a from the equations which could be a good shortcut for certain types of questions i wanted to point out on the last formula that what this says is the total displacement on the left here is equal to the arithmetic mean just the simple average of the initial and final velocities multiplied by how much time has gone by again this only works if a is constant though all right because the derivative relationships are exactly the same for theta omega and alpha all the same equations drop out of the math and i get a set of equations that looks like this again the first two those come directly from applying calculus to the derivative relationships between these kinematic variables the second two come from algebraic manipulations of the first two which can save you a little bit of time depending on what you're given in a problem so let's check out an example okay in this introductory example we're told that a flywheel accelerates at a constant rate from rest well, that means omega naught equals zero to 100 radians per second. That means omega, the final angular velocity, is 100. And the time for the process is one and a half seconds. So that's our t. t equals 1.5. And we're asked, compute the average angular acceleration. Our average angular acceleration is just a delta omega. How much did the angular velocity change divided by how much time went by and so that's 100 radians per second if I'm real formal about this the initial was 0 so I'll put that in so 100 minus 0 over the time it took which was one and a half seconds in rounding it I get 66.7 radians per second squared Part B, compute the total angle through which the flywheel turned. So it's key here that the acceleration was constant. That means we're allowed to use the kinematics formulas for constant acceleration. And what I'm using here is just the first formula. Theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. And I can set my initial angular position to zero without any loss of generality. So this is really just the choice of where you're going to paint the spot of paint on the flywheel. And when t is zero, I'd like that spot to be at theta equals zero, so I don't have to worry about it. My initial angular velocity was zero because it started from rest. And now I should be able to get my angle out of this. One half times alpha, which was 66.7 radians per second squared times how much time went by, 1.5 seconds squared. You can see the seconds squared cancel, leaving me with units of radians. And for this, I get 75.0 radians. Now remember, radians are technically unitless. It's not harmful to write them, but if you're checking in the back of a book or something, you might not see them. Part C, express the answer to B in rotations instead of radians. So this is very typical for these problems to have to convert back and forth between rotations and radians. So I have 75.0 radians, and it's just a little unit analysis problem. I have one rotation for every 2 pi radians. And I can find out how many times this flywheel actually turned. And I get 11.9 rotations. So that's it for our quick introduction to rotational kinematics. And of course, there's a lot of variety of problems to explore after this, but I like to keep these videos short.